Okay, I guess um, <clears throat> we'll get started. And uh, you know, as people are able to join us, they'll they'll roll on in. Here comes Janet Peel. Um, anyway, um, so we'll, let's start with uh, an introduction. Uh, Ernie Pomerlo is joining us today. Thank you, Ernie, for joining us. Um, um, Ernie's, of course, um, the um, head right now of a, a real estate agency in Burlington that is quite familiar, and you've seen the signs everywhere with the with the great big pillars from uh, their, their, their office on, uh, on College Street. Um, Ernie's also, uh, his family is also, um, has a very strong reputation for um, philanthropy in our area, um, and including a very generous support for Alliance Francaise. Um, Ernie has been, uh, was for a number of years, the, um, the consul of, hello, Barbara, you're, you're new, you did, you have a, I know there's some background noise that's so loud, it's very hard to hear. Could people um, all mute, please, who are not muted? Okay, that should help. At any rate, um, as I was saying, um, Ernie is also uh, was the, the honorary consul of France from Vermont. I got to try to get that, that, that terminology, right? And more recently was, um, honored uh, being inducted into the French, uh, again, I, I forget the, the actual term, but as basically he, he was knighted by France, a, a, an honor very rarely given to somebody outside of France. And so um, I, he's got a lot of background uh, in his interest in French. Uh, he's got a lot, a lot of background in philanthropy and um, very strong uh, re you know, relationship with the Burlington area. So we're really delighted to have him come and and talk to us a little bit. Um, so, I, Ernie, do you want to start with uh, some opening remarks before we get into? Oh, no, it's good to be here. I've uh, I, I've been involved with the, as you noted, the consulate in Boston. Uh, so, a little little history. So, it's good to be here, and it's good to see the alliance so strong. It's gone through waves over the last decade or so, mm -hmm. and uh, it's really fun to see it back. I, I think it's a it, it was an underknown uh, entity that has kind of come into its own. And I just think that given the fact that 40% of our, you know, the county here is, has French heritage and with us so close to Canada and with a lot of French businesses here, it, it sort of supports that culture. It supports the business and economic component. So I've always seen it as a, the centerpiece for the French culture to continue to keep it alive. It's the, the, consul, the consul general of Boston obviously is up here all the time and interacting and watching its impact and working with schools. And anyway, I'm happy to get in Dan, with your questions, but I'm delighted to be here. I've, I've, I've been a member of the Alliance since the beginning, you know, when I took this thing over, well now way over 10 years ago. Um, and was a very strong supporter. I, I got into, it was kind of funny, I kind of got every, into everything in the back door, I'll tell you a funny story. So um, General, uh, Governor Douglas at the time had called me in and he goes, I said, so I've got some good news and I've got some bad news. And the, he said, the bad news is, after he called in all the chits and I said, oh, I, whatever he's gonna ask me, I gotta do, right? So he said, you've got to, I'm going to make you the um, chairman of the Governor's Commission on Climate Change. And I went, okay. Actually, it was, it was quite a stint. I won't go into that one. But then I said, so what's the good news? He said, I just made you uh, Consul General of uh, France to Vermont. And I laughed. I said, why? He said, because your name is Pamela. And so um, anyway, I, I thought he was kidding. And then the next thing I know, I, I get a get out of jail card from the Secretary of State um, presented to me by the ambassador. But it, it was a it was a fascinating journey, one that I I got into politically because we were in the that um, <clears throat> quad centennial, and because of the connections that I had, I just thought, well, I'll just do this for a year and I'll do all this economic interaction and French interaction. But it grew and grew and grew and grew. And so Francois, who was the chairman at the, I mean, the, the consulate general at the time, and I had the best time working with this quad centennial. So we created this little triangle, which was France, 
and Quebec and Vermont. And it, it blossomed into uh, cultural interchanges and statues and Patrick and Marcel went up, uh, Leahy and did a whole shtick up there. We went up to Quebec, we, they came down here. The French was well represented. Anyway, so this quadcentennial and this connection. So you have En Fleur where Champlain left to come to Quebec to found Quebec. And then in 1609 came down and discovered Lake Champlain. So I said, what amazing uh, triangle. So why don't we amplify that? Why don't we play that and see where that goes? And that's where all of a sudden I'm like interacting with the Alliance Francaise going, wow, you know, this is, this is an instrumental part of bringing this to the surface. Um, and what a platform, what a stage to use the quad centennial in this celebration of Champlain, of France, of Quebec, the connectivity, the political, economic, cultural interaction. So that was kind of my sweet spot. Um, and I had a blast doing it. We had the ambassador of France come up and we had all sorts of political and, and all this stuff. And, and it just culture, I mean, French performers came down acting on Church Street. We had all sorts of political connections from France to Quebec that I think helped spawn some of the stuff which later uh, Douglas and, and, uh, and uh, Phil Scott would uh, promote. And there was about, and we had conversations on energy. We had conversation on tourism and how to make it better and bigger and better, all out of this connection to Lake Champlain, Samuel D. Champlain and En Fleur. And then out of that, of course, was this next step. I'm like, I read about En Fleur and I said, yeah, that's a really pretty town. I think I want to go there. So let's make it a sister city. <laughs> so, we, uh, so we started that. Pro it's, in France, it takes 10 years. But we, as you know, uh, Lise Averno has been, um, you know, part of your system for a very long time. And she, ha I had her head up the chairperson of the En Fleur com uh, Committee. And we developed this Burlington on Fleur, we went to on Fleur and we, we brought him a ship or sent him a ship, the uh, Don de Dieu, the gift of God, which was the name of the ship that uh, Champlain sailed over here. So I, I had, we had a replica made and we delivered it to uh, the city hall and it's in city hall and big glass thing um, where Michel the mayor, who's still the mayor uh, and a delightful human being, um, we were there for quite some time and had a lot of interaction and started to set the connections of art between Burlington and, and uh, Enfleur. We created some economic ties. We had French teachers um, connecting and students and baseball teams went over and it was just, and our mayor went over there, their mayor came over here. And we started to develop this Enfleur connection, this French connection. And then as we developed the Quebec connection and we started to see from all this flourishing, you know, way over a million people a year, well, before pandemic, uh, would come across the border. And you start to quantify that in metrics and you look at the value to the, tour, the, the Canadian tourists to the United to Vermont, it's huge and multi, multi millions of dollars. And so how do we, how do we foster that? And then you and I talked about the, the percentage of uh, Canadians on the lake, right? And many of the restaurants are supported 50% in July and August by them. So this is a whole interconnection. And out of that just kind of continued this uh, ongoing liaison of our strong cultural French connection to France, our strong cultural French connection, political connection to Quebec and, and to Burlington and Vermont. And so out of that, my being consul general, um, con the honorary consul, it just sort of one year after the other just fed into, you know, I'm in real estate. It's not all bad for me. It's a good thing. 
Um, my family, uh, you know, came from France. Uh, my father and, and was born in Lobos, right? Um, so he, he didn't speak French until he was like four years old. I mean, English until he was four years old. And so there's a whole history of that connection. And so I, I, I by accident, became the honorary consul, expected to do it for a year. I did it for 10 years. And I, and it, I had fun. And I had fun in the connection of this French connection um, and creating this triangle with France and Quebec and Vermont. And I saw it spawning some economic basis, but uh, I saw it spawning an appreciation, a deep, deep appreciation for the French culture and our history. Well, thanks for that. That was uh, a nice little tour of you, you know how you got involved and in, and in, in where you've taken us. You touched very briefly on uh, your family's history, your dad coming over from France. Can you tell us a little more whereabouts in France? When did he come over? Why did he come over? Um, what, so, you know, what's your well, and, and our, our history was actually Vachon. And so Etienne Vachon, who was born in Nice, France, which actually at one time was Nietzsche, right? It was Italian. So my father's name is Antonio. In a, freely, in, a, in, a, in a French tradition, it would be Anthony. But his name was Antonio. And I've all, I was always curious why he was Antonio and not Anthony. He didn't even know until we did some research. So Nice had been part of Italy. Nietzsche, I guess the way the Italians would pronounce it. So then the French took it back and it became Nice. But there was still a lot of um, old Italian heritage. And so down over the years, there were Antonios and he got to be Antonio. And so that was the... That was kind of the heritage. So <clears throat> Etienne came to Quebec and they in that Lebeau's area. And then as it turns out from the history that we can gather, um, everybody was Joseph and Mary Vachon. <laughs> it was like <laughs> everybody was Joseph and Mary Vachon. So two brothers woke up one day and go, you know, we're going to change our name. And there's a lot of hypothesis of how Pomelo came, apple water, it's a small bird. Anyway, the word Pomelo was developed a few generations ago. And so it's easy for me to follow my tree because anybody with that name, I can go back to, um, you know, this province in, in uh, just outside of Montreal uh, very quickly. So there's all these connections because it's an unusual name. It really, it, it has an L-E-A-U at the end, <clears throat> but it was, created. So it was kind of funny how that happens. And so, <clears throat> so my, my mother is Canadian, but she's from uh, Melrose, New Brunswick. So they were both Canadians. They were both Catholics, but one was Irish and one was French. That was a mixed marriage. <laughs> the French didn't want the Irish and the Irish didn't want the French. Well, that happened in Burlington with the St. Joseph Cathedral and the and the the uh, uh, the other cathedral, it was French and Irish, so that mm -hmm. held on for a while. Anyway, they got married, and uh, but before that, so my my grandfather Ernest um, came down was one of the few. A lot of the Pomelos came to Maine on the potato farms and the uh, timber, but he was one of the few, as far as I can gather, the only one that came down into across the border in the Derby area in Newport. And my father um, came down as a baby. And so he was a Vermonter from, you know, three months, I guess. And it was the, an interesting history. So here's this very French family, spoke very little English. Um, they had three children, he was the youngest. And then when he was three, he fell down or was pushed downstairs, we don't know, fell on a, a pail. And his left side stopped growing at the rate that his right side. He lived for six years in a, a corset, a metal corset. Um, and so oh. a lot of that created his character, who he was, his focus going forward. Um, 
and the like. And at night, you'll like this because this is the Catholic French part. Um, the patron saint of Quebec is Saint Anne, the mother of Mary, right? And so this is how French we are. My middle, my name at confirmation is Anne. I was up with the bishop before he did this on me, looks at me and he goes, Ernest, he goes, it says Anne. I went, I know. <laughs> it's okay. So when I was 12 years old, I had done a pilgrimage to St. Anne de Beaupre once or twice a year. I, I had St. Anne everything. So I just thought she was my patron saint. So I was going to take her name on a confirmation. And um, so, but before that, my grandmother um, took my father when he was nine years old because they said he wouldn't live to be 12. He died at 100. <laughs> he buried every doctor that told him he was going to be dead. So he went to St. Anne de Beaupre with my, grandma, with my grandmother, his mother, and they did all of the magical stuff of the going up the steps. And anyway, at the end of this, my grandmother took off his uh, corset, his brace, and hung it up. Now you could call it the power of prayer, you could call it a miracle, you could power, call it suggestion, uh, or just coincidence, whatever you want to call it. But um, from that point on, he left side started to grow, and he lived to be 100. And there was no doctor that said he would live to be 12. So then he, so then as he started to formulate all his connections to Newport and to Derby and the school up there. Um, he then traveled and he came to Burlington, uh, probably his 18th stop. He was a manager of Endicott Johnson Shoes and a troubleshooter. So they moved him all over the place. And he came to Burlington and he goes, you know, I'm gonna plant, I'm gonna plant my roots here. And so it was kind of fun as I grew up in the old North End in a rented um, uh, apartment for a while. And then we moved to the new North End. But the connection I have is Winooski then was all French. You didn't need to speak English in Winooski. You had every, anything you needed, you could get in French, right? And the, 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 the mill was the, you know, the, the mill was still in operation. Um, families had come down from Canada. Um, we, we had people and all my, I, my, my grandmother lived there. I would go there. Um, and so everything was, I always brought up French. That's why when you said Abby Page, when I, years ago, when you, um, we had a, one of the, your weekends and we had her for the first time and she did, well, I don't remember her first call. I think it was in all things French or something like that. Anyway, I laughed constantly through that. It was as if my life was being unfolded in front of me, right? Mm -hmm. The terms river rats I had forgotten about. <laughs> I mean, it, Winooski was this, you know, other planet place and yeah. um, the, the, the fact of the churches and the going to French masses and everything like that was just, my grandmother didn't speak English. And so I, and so Winooski and, you know, the old North End and then having this whole, you know, collectivity um, of French around me. My mother was very Irish. So on St. Patrick's Day, I was Ernest Murphy. <laughs> so, so I have the French Irish, but that's the that was the whole history of France to Quebec, and then my grandparents coming down to Newport, running a farm, um, going through all sorts of stuff. My father learning how to manage through some you know complicated times, and then finally landing in Burlington. But we've often said, you know, his brain was in Burlington, but his heart was in Newport. And so we've always been very supportive of Newport and projects that they've had up there. We have a lot of property up there. Um, but I remember once, I, I love this. So they were going to appoint him the Grand Marshal. Now watch this. So Newport, um, it, the city, when it, it was a town earlier, but it had transferred to a city. So they were having the city's 100th anniversary. And so um, dad was going to be the grand marshal. So we, we, we got a hundred year old car and we were going to have a hundred year old man 
<laughs> celebrating a hundred years of the um, of, of Newport. Well, they fortunately at my backing had a, a prior year making him the grand marshal because at a hundred, you never know how long you, you don't, you don't get uh, unripened bananas, right? And so we went up and he, he got the grand marshal certification. So the following July, um, the parade was still put on. So we had the hundred year old car, the hundred year ceremony, but on the side, it was Tony Pomelo Grand Marsh. So he lives on in there and they named a the park after him. And um, so it's been, Newport has been a, a place of ancient French cultural connections where he grew up and he still, you know, philanthropically sponsored the lot. And so we continue that in his memory. Very good segue to my next question for you. Um, your dad and, and you, um, your family, um, has a really strong uh, reputation in the Burlington area for, 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 for philanthropy. Your dad's name is on uh, the new YMCA. Um, you've been very supportive of us and other um, French and other uh, kinds of things. And I wondered where that, that uh, strong vein of, of uh, philanthropy comes from in your family. Well, I think with a with a core philosophical belief that um, you know when an area and a population is really good to you, and you benefited from the environment in which you um, do business, you really have a, a deep deep obligation to give back. Um, you know, with the idea that you know dying with a lot of money. <laughs> when I do a lot of hospice work and, and I would tell you that a belief is when you cross over, um, you're not asked how much money you made, you're asked what you did with the money you had. And so mm -hmm. that's really kind of at the core. Um, and just like I said, whatever we do to support the Alliance and the um, that that is just part of that cultural web. It's a, but they're all tied economically. Everything touches everything else. You, it's like a mobile. You touch any part of the mobile and it works. Um, so I, we have been blessed with organizations such as the Alliance, but also, you know, when I look around and I see the, here's a, here's a classic example, because it's a good question. And we don't do it just, you know, to shine light on ourselves. We hope to shine light on others. And so the Boys and Girls Club, um, they had a program called Early Opportunity, Early Education. And so um, needless to say, they are the home to a lot of disadvantaged children that are challenged, right? And they give them opportunities. So they wanted us to do a, a scholarship program, mentoring program and the like. So the first year, this we're now almost in our ninth year now. So the first year, what they did is they set up a mentorship that because these kids that came over, new Americans and, and existing Americans, really did not feel that they had an opportunity to go to college or to learn or to expand. They, they had been kind of trapped in a, family environment that didn't go on for education. They weren't sure what they were gonna do. Um, so it was this, how do you break the chains of poverty and, and, and the like? And so what they did is they set up these uh, tutoring programs to encourage children to learn. And with the idea that if you learn and you stay with it, there will be scholarships to help you get into college. And they worked out a whole bunch of programs. The first year we had one scholarship program. Last year, we had 41. So 41 kids took advantage of this system of being tutored. Now, think about the ripple effect of 40 people a year that would go on to, you know, using government subsidies versus these kids come back and they are the ones that teach the children under them, the eighth graders and the sophomores. Because what I've, what I've seen, there's a beautiful old saying, <clears throat> um, you know, action without vision is just running in place. Vision without action is just a dream. Vision with action will change the world. 
So if you change somebody's vision of the future and you give them hope, those two things are lacking. They just stay stuck in their place. You change the vision and the opportunity that something is going to be able to be happened if you pay attention to it. It changes that. So I've looked at projects with, um, you know, everything from, you know, what Spectrum does in this place, what Boys and Girls does, does in this place, what the YMCA provides, what Lund provides, what COTS provides. Uh, it's an endless plethora of people with high energy um, doing really good stuff. We, we live in a political arena that is the most polarized I've ever seen since 1968. It's a tragedy. It's a tragedy. But under that are an amazing amount of people that are um, giving and selfless and changing the world around us. And that's the kind of thing that I love to see. I mean, if you look at the Alliance Francaise and said, really, let's tangibly look at how we've changed people around us, the culture, the economics, the, the flavor, and, and, and saving our French heritage um, and giving more focus on Canadian connections and the French connections, it's huge. It's huge. And it's part of this. You know, it's like a mosaic. Every, every time you put a little piece of a mosaic down, it's not much. But as you sit back and you watch all the little pieces, it's a beautiful picture. So we see, we have an obligation to give back. Um, and we do it selectively and we do it carefully. Um, Mark and Anna got dad on the building in St. Mike's. <laughs> and so they... Uh, you know, that, that, but I, a bunch of us have gone to St. Mike's. Um, it's an integral part of our fabric in Chittenden County. Um, it's a beautiful uh, piece of the economics and the education and the culture. And so those are the kinds of things that we just see, you know, of, of things expanding as we do it. And it's, it's imperative that we do do that. I, I, I wouldn't, I could not do that. Well, we all thank you for all your support in all of those many areas. And of course, for us, especially for us at Alliance Francaise. Um, but I wanted to maybe turn to a slightly different um, topic of conversation. Uh, we know about your real estate business. We know now a lot more about your passion for French, where it came from, your ancestry. But um, I was wondering if you could maybe tell us a little more about Ernie as a as a person, as a, as an individual. I wondered, like, what kind of interests you have. You mentioned when we were starting up that you do Tai Chi. You mentioned earlier that you are a, a big uh, sailor. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about um, what makes Ernie tick? <laughs> That's an interesting question. One I did not expect, so I will um try to deal out with that fairly and honestly without grandiosity. Um, so I would say that I, I am a person who has a great deal of passions. Um, I feel that's critical. Um, I don't define myself by my work. Um, my work, you know, is part of my ministry. Um, but I have I would say I have a passion for Tai Chi. I've studied it for 40 years. I was in karate. But what I love about it is its philosophy is similar to my passion in sailing, Aging. the way I probably spend time negotiating. So Tai Chi, for example, is a function of if you're attacked, you don't do anything. You just move with your opponent. And if you're rooted, you control them. They don't control you. So it's a good mental thing. It's a good physical thing. I teach in Europe. I have actually part of why uh, En Fleur came to be is I had been traveling to Avignon and to Paris uh, with a bunch of people teaching various schools in France. And I, I thought, well, I'm going there anyway. I ought to be able to stop for a little few days in En Fleur and see what's going on there. So Tai Chi has been a fabric, something I do every day. Um, I am very spiritual. 
Um, by definition, that's kind of an open thing. It's my definition. Um, I do uh, hospice work. I have found that to be probably the biggest gateway into my spirituality that I have ever found. If you're holding somebody's hand when they're passing and you feel them pass through you and your feelings are of bliss and euphoria and not being afraid and your fear of death goes away, it's a pretty, pretty incredible gateway to another feeling and thoughts and, and progress of how you see your life. And so I look at my life from this. The, so the question I always have is, <clears throat> I, I believe that you judge yourself when you cross over. You are not judged. It's different than a lot of religions and I don't hold. Um, anybody can believe what they want. And so I believe that you're, you judge yourself. So the question I had for myself is, so if I'm gonna judge myself and I can get to write this stuff, what, what do I want it to be? What do I want it to say? What do, I want it, what do I want it to see and do? And I could then look after at the end and say, good job. So now I have the intention after my daughter passed that I, my whole focus of going forward is very different. So every day when I make a decision, I make it with the intention of, if I were to look at this decision at the end of my life, what would it what, what what would I want it to be? It's a very different chapter. It's a very different losing your daughter is beyond anything that any parent can comprehend. And I'm dealing with that. So that's you've asked me a question who I am. This is my next chapter, and I have to rewrite it, and I have to write it in a way that I can be proud of. And so, you know, those are pieces of it. i'm I'm a a very um, competitive sailor. I sail in uh, a one design called Etchels. I race in four regattas in the winter. I love it. It's a good excuse to drink beer and be in a bathing suit and in the warmth <laughs> outside of Vermont. And we do fairly well. I race on Lake Champlain. Um, I love the water. I love the mountains. Um, I meditate. I, uh, and I, I work really hard. And we've developed a wonderful <clears throat> company that has been, you know, we've been blessed. We've been very fortunate. And in that gift of being fortunate, we had that discussion of we feel we've got to give uh, a portion of that away. Well, that's a, that was a great response. Um, I actually had the sad, uh, sad whatever opportunity to be holding my father-in-law's hand as he passed. So I know. I know what what that what that feels like, and so thanks for sharing that, um, and thanks for sharing you know your your spirituality. That's uh, an important part of of what we're learning here. Um, we well, have so about. I, another... I would say I would say that that you know I I because I've done a lot of contemplation this, but you know we we talk about ourselves being <clears throat> bodies with a soul, but we're actually souls with a body, and you know we talk about um, you know the human being being on a spiritual journey. I believe we're a spiritual being on a human journey and this is an earth suit. And we just, we got to treat it well and we've got to learn from it because it's a, this is earth school. So I'm really glad that we're recording this because there's some pretty amazing quotes that are coming out of this and I'm going to have to listen to it and write them all down because uh, this, is, this has really been very interesting. Um, we have about 20 minutes left um, and you know, there are a few people out there that might have a few things, a uh, few questions they'd like to ask. So um, if you would like to do that, just sort of raise your hand a little bit and I can uh, call you and uh, let you mute your, unmute yourself. Not all at once now. <laughs> Go ahead, Mel. You're on, you're on mute. You're muted still, Mel. You have to unmute. Hey. There you go. Um, my, I just want to say that uh, you're talking about your childhood and growing up and the French connection that you had. 
that really mirrors my own husband's experience as um, the child of immigrants from Quebec who were of course also from France. And um, I just was interested in what Burlington was like back when you were growing up. If you could talk a little bit more about your interactions and with um, Burlington school system in particular um, and, and that aspect. Sure. Um, so I, I moved, I was born in the old North End. I was on basically North Winooski and North Street and a, an apartment. So back then it was kind of interesting for those that weren't ever here then, North Street was actually a very prosperous retail space. Um, the economy department store, Burlington Paint Tile, before Gaines, Maisel's had a shoe store there. There were a couple of shoe stores. Kalodney's had a huge uh, supermarket at the end of North Street um, on North Avenue. And so I remember as a kid from coming down North Street, my mother would bring me down in a stroller or walk me down and they would kind of, you know, that would be kind of a daily ritual of going down into the shops and the restaurants and the like. And then uh, simultaneously over at Church Street, not too far away, um, you had, uh, there were no shopping centers, right? And that you had, on Church Street, you had Sears, you had Pennies, you had Abernethy's, you had Megrams, right? Big department stores. You had Kresge's, you had Centers. Um, in addition, you had like five men's stores from Nate's to Hayes and Carney to Shepard and Hermel. Um, Megrams had their men's store. Abernethy's had the men's store. There was all sorts of women's stores, Hecky Pasacal. <laughs> you know, running, um, oh, blank, I'm blanking. But anyway, there were hat shops and it was, you know, root beer and uh, A&Ws and all sorts of restaurants up and down uh, the hitching post. And my father had a little office um, on Church Street. And so we would go and visit. And this was, you know, so Church Street was obviously a traffic before the, the, the mall, but it was, it was very, con you know, congenial and friendly everybody knew everybody it was kind of like small a very small intimate community uh even though there was tourism and stuff but there wasn't a lot of hotel the hotel vermont and um you know it was just it was a much quieter softer space so then when i went out to north uh north avenue um I was just listen did that happen so the first light traffic light <laughs> was up <laughs> On Red by Redstone up on Main Street on South Prospect. That was the first traffic light. And then uh, JC Penney's had the first escalator. And everybody <laughs> ran down to JC Penney to ride on the only escalator in Vermont. And uh, it's where CVS is now. And so have, having that was um, fascinating and to think about that. So, I mean, that. that the what? Oh, anyway, there was, so first traffic light, first escalator, um, it was, it was the blossoming. And then when I was on North Avenue, we ended up having a place way on Colchester Point that we rented during the summer, but you crossed the Heinerberg Bridge and you were in nowhere land. You traveled forever, you know, with just a couple of houses and and the spots, and of course, that's very different today. And it's blossomed over, you know, 50, 60 years. So it was the school system. I went to Christ, I went to uh, their school. Oh, this is a cute story. I have to pass this on because it's part of my French heritage, although it's on my mother's side. Um, and and uh, so I, I went to what is now a doctor's office and where the apartments are with their school was, there was this beautiful old historic building. That's where my kindergarten was. So I was up in Melrose, New Brunswick, where I would go up every summer. And I was late. And my mother's tradition, Irish, but it was British. 
the, the British were very influential. The French were very influential in Quebec. British were very influential in New Brunswick. So she was brought up where you were, had uniforms at school and you were very, you know, everything was, you know, British. So I'm probably a week late uh, going to school. So I'm kind of like everybody else has formed their little cliques in kindergarten and stuff. And I show up and I realize as I walk into my kindergarten class that I'm a geek. And I'm like, what is going on? I had no idea. I looked around, everybody was in, you know, casual shirts and little chino pants. I have an Eaton hat. I have a black blazer. I have a white shirt, black tie, black Bermuda shorts, knee high socks and patent leather shoes. That's the way they dress when they went to school in New Brunswick. And I'm sitting here going, oh God, I think I'm going to die. <laughs> Fortunately, and I can remember this to this day and thank God she, I have prayers for her. The, the teacher, Mrs. Yuri, goes, oh, children, look at Ernest has come to do a show and tell for us. <laughs> she realized I was like dying. And she quickly goes, she said, Ernest has, Ernest has come to do a show and tell. And he's going to put on and we've invited him to show how they dress in Canada. He just came down from Canada. And this is the way that they go to school. And what a surprise. And I think, I'm like, I think I love you. <laughs> so anyway, I still have that little Eaton hat. That was the last time I ever wore it. I went home and I said, Bob, you need to burn me. <laughs> so, but I showed up at kindergarten with my Canadian mother um, dressed in an Eaton hat and a tie and Bermuda shorts. And that was not the plan. So anyway, that was, uh, that's, that was my education opening in, in Thayer School. So I went there for a few years. Um, then I went to Christ the King, and then I went to Rice. Okay, I saw a hand, um, a QL, I don't know. Uh, go ahead. <laughs> I have to unmute, unmute yourself. Oh, sorry. There, there you go. Oh. Okay, well, I appreciate all your stories and your life has, you know, been whatever it's been. Um, but do you take political stances at all? Or are you worried at all about <laughs> democracy and all that stuff? I, I'm sorry, could you repeat that? I didn't catch okay. that. Okay, I appreciate all your stories. Yeah. And, and you've had a very unique experience and I'm wondering just about, are you worried about democracy as it exists today? Oh, democracy. democracy. Oh. Are, are you at all political? I'm very political, <laughs> but I'm, I'm a centrist. I'm a moderate. I, I believe that, uh, you know, the far left and the far right are fighting themselves, um, you know, without a heart, without a soul, with some, there's some discussion decisions going on, um, you know, I, there's an interesting thing that's happening in a week that I'm going to attend called Braver Angels mm -hmm. uh, of how to bring the two. Now, you're not going to bring the far, far left and the far, far right. Um, that's never going to happen. There are topics that simply cannot be bridged. But I, I believe that when you come in from the far left and the far right, and you've got moderate right, moderate left and centrist, um, I believe there's, there's ample opportunity to um, have a dialogue that needs to be changed. It's so polarized, um, but at the same time, somebody said, well, it's never been this bad. Well, I lived as many of you did through 1968. There were machine gun turrets in front of the White House. There was, um, and Watts was burning, Rossi buildings were burning, Martin Luther King was assassinated, Bobby Kennedy was assassinated, changes at the Vatican and religious re revival, um, you know, marijuana was coming in, Budweiser was going out, um, you know, Haight-Ashbury was coming into play, Kent State was happening, um, it was, it, it, there was protests, Vietnam, we lost 55,000 men, so it was horrible. 
Um, I would put an analogous that the, 20, the 2022 process um, has created some very deep, deep polarization that needs to be done. I think what happened in the last few years, sadly though, is somebody didn't create this, they awakened it. Um, there, there's an underpinning. I just read the book Caste, C-A-S-T-E, yep. that, talks, that talks about uh, caste system, the Hindu caste system in India. But I would tell you that if you look around, we have a caste system and there is some white supremacy issues and the like, and that's been awakened from deep beside. She used the analogy that there were reindeer buried 50 years ago that this permafrost in Siberia kind of went below and the carcasses came out, that anthrax came out and started to kill people. Well, the analogy is that, you know, there's a latent hostility um, that has been given permission to come out. And so what that looks like, why that exists, um, I don't know, but there's a lot of anger. There's a lot of hate. Um, how you... Um, justify a January 6th or QAnon theory or um, a lot of lies, I don't know. But I do know that there's really good people. Um, this, we have survived wars and we have survived um, a lot of, I mean, remember in 1950, we had Joe McCarthy. People supported Joe McCarthy and communism, right? And then if you look at what happened in the fifth, if you read Cass and you look at what racism did in this country up and continues, but right through the 50s. So in 63, we had Lyndon, do, Lyndon Johnson do the civil rights. Well, we never quite completed that. Um, so there's still hostilities and every, when you, when you have a group, how do you explain the Hutus and the Tutsis in Rwanda? We have in our community, we have in our society, a, by the way, the Star Wars with Darth Vader is a metaphor, but it's true. We all have a dark side that we can choose to go to or the light. I have a fundamental philosophy, and it's after my daughter. You cannot push out darkness. You can only bring in light. And that grief, so there's darkness and there's light. You can only bring it in. And where there's grief, you have to bring in love. There's nothing above love, nothing under grief. There's nothing under darkness and nothing above love and light. So it's a long-winded answer to your question. And I don't have a question. I mean, I don't have an answer. Am I worried about democracy? Yes. Um, do we have the tools to bring ourselves back? We always have. We've survived stupid. We have to survive stupid. Um, where we are as a society now, I think the majority of us are fine. I just think that there is a, a need. When somebody wants to feel superior, they've got to make somebody else go down. That's just the nature of human psychology. It's not correct, but that's what happens. So as you find people feeling superior, they need to push down people that they see as inferior. That's the caste system. Martin Luther King was introduced in India in 1967 as a, the, a speaker from the untouchable class in America. It even caught Martin Luther King by surprise. But in fact, there's some, some truth to that. So I, am I afraid of, the, in answer to your question, am I afraid of democracy in peril? Yes. Um, will we come out of this crazy spiral? Yes. Well, thanks. Um, I think um, Tortoise had a question. She actually put it in the chat. Uh, maybe Tortoise, you'd like to just um, ask it. <laughs> sure. This is back to French again. <laughs> uh, and I really enjoyed this so much. I'm, I'm watching from Bennington. Uh, but uh, back in, you talked about the uh, France, Quebec, Vermont Triangle. And yeah. I attended that wonderful French Connection Conference in March 2017. And I'm just wondering uh, how five years later, what kind of progress has been made in the teaching and the fluency of French 
primarily cl closer up in the Burlington area, probably, but all over Vermont. Well, I think Michelle would know better than I am <laughs> on the teachings, but I think I think in the the whole French connection, which is integral to the 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 the, the conversation and the French connection. I mean, look what we do in March when they unfurl a flag that shows, what is it, 26 countries or something like that? And the connectivity of that, that conversation, that uh, language um, and the connectivity of all those countries, but in particularly with us being so close to the border, I would tell you that because of the strength that's now growing in the Alliance Francaise, that you are like at the point end of this discussion on that question without, without any question in my mind whatsoever. There's nobody else in that role to do that. Um, and we've set up, you know, the Enfleur Committee that helps promote. Um, we have the Honorary Consul uh, Department and the Consul General of Boston. Uh, we've got all these connections that have spawned over the last five years. It's been fun to watch our artists go to Enfleur. Their artists come here. There's a whole new group coming this October. Um, we've formalized that. Um, I love the fact that at these March um, flag raising, we have so many people coming from the Quebec uh, congregation and political side, both from Boston and from Quebec. Um, I, I just love the, the connectivity and what's happened over the last five to 10 years, that it's become the norm and not the exception. Well, I love to see the teaching of French, at least some French to people in the hospitality industry so that so they can- I, I would agree with you and I'm, I could not agree with you more. And that's something that I have to I'll actually help step up. So I'll tell, you, I'll tell you a little anecdotal piece that you may or may not know. So. Ten years ago, I uh, I worked with Alliance uh, Francaise, and we had a, a program for the retail and hospitality industry. And if nothing else, just to say hello, thank you. Understand where the toilet is. I mean, the, some really basic, but it was as much of a of a respect um, as it was to do any linguistics. So. Ironically, uh, WCAX came to one of those classes and filmed something. They put into their program that night, like a three minute piece. It must've been, I don't, they, that's a long time. It's a huge piece. And they interviewed a bunch of people going back and forth. Now remember, when people in Montreal wanna watch CBS, ABC, NBC, and see the United States, they are connected to that. The number of people that were watching American news that night was very high. Mm. And I got a bunch of calls in the morning. Anyway, long story short was on the front page of a French speaking newspaper with a picture of a uh, Unitarian church, it said, um, uh, Burlington welcomes their French friends to the north or something like that. Mm. But then it went into the story that they're going out of their way to learn French, to speak, to do whatever. And I, I'm holding this page up. I said, you couldn't buy $100,000 worth of advertising in Montreal um, <laughs> and get that, yeah. that approach. So your point is super well taken. And I started a program, and maybe we should talk about it at another time with the Alliance, is that um, it's imperative to me, and I've talked to Ev at the Bistro and and the like that we need to have a French page in all the menus in Burlington. We need to have more uh, discussion and signs about welcoming our friends to the north um, and that we speak French. And we had buttons and we had, I think the pandemic kind of knocked us down on that, but it's a good reminder that we should continue that effort because I think it's it shows respect to a million people coming across the border. Um, and it's it's simple and it's easy. It's not expensive. And if we have a choice of them going to Plattsburgh or them coming to Burlington, we want them to come to Burlington. So thank you. Well, 
I think that's a great reminder. And I think uh, it's something for us to take up um, at Alliance Frances. Uh, I think we could you know, do the maybe the classes for businesses again. I like the idea of um, uh, you know menus, uh, French menu uh, page. Yeah. Um, th those are some some really good suggestions that we can. Well, can let's take. take up. I, and I would, and I think teeing that up because I think it's a, a, I think that's at the cornerstone of what um, the Alliance Francaise can do to help um, inject this idea back into the community. And I would be. Um, extremely happy to support that. Excellent. Glad to hear that. Um, Dana, uh, I think there's one time for one more quick question. It is. We I'll, make it, I'll make it quick. It's actually not a question. I'm uh, Donna Vanderheiden. My husband is Mark, former former Burlingtonians or, or uh, close to Burlington. And I'm one of the founding mothers of the original Alliance Française. But I wanted to mention something that um, I think, and, and Ernie knows because he was very much part of this too. There's a plaque in Paris, oh, which yeah. is from the city of Burlington, which acknowledges the fact that this was the, the area or the street in the Rue Saint-Ange where Samuel de Champlain had, had, uh, had lived for some time. And it's, it's, a, it's in French, it's a, it was made in Vermont. In fact, uh, Doreen Kraft and I ha uh, handed it over to the uh, mayor of the Troisième Arrondissement. And uh, I'm not sure if the Alliance is aware of it, but maybe I should send the picture sometime to, to yes. Dana. Uh, because when one goes to Paris, I think you'd all enjoy seeing this plaque in a very prominent spot that talks about uh, the Samuel de Champlain who came and uh, okay, that the plaque the was and, and went uh, that the city of Burlington dedicated this plaque to the role of Samuel de Champlain in uh, France and in, in the US and Burlington. So maybe yeah. I'll send it that on. But yeah, I, no, I, that I, would be great. And, and Dan is the, the Enfleur ambassador and the one that actually with the Maritime Museum got us to get the Don de Dieu, um, you know, built and, and created and brought over to Enfleur. And we have one at the airport and I have one in my office. Yeah. It's all a mosaic, as you said, Ernie, all the little pieces that yeah. come together and the people that come together. That's really I, what this is. Well, well said, you're right. And if you uh, send that to me, I can we can get I that will. into our newsletter and all onto our, our website. So yeah. Be um, happy to, be happy to. Great to see I all see of you. My, uh, my clock on my computer shows one o'clock, uh, yep. which about the time that we promised Ernie we would end. Um, so I would uh, give a great big thank you to Ernie for uh, for sharing an hour with us. And uh, we learned a lot more about Ernie than we knew. And, uh, thank probably you very more, much. Probably more than you wanted to, but absolutely not. I think it's been great. So uh, yes, um, Ernie, we'll be in touch about some okay. other things. Yeah, wait, and I'm sincere about that. I, I love that. Um, that suggestion is something we were very engaged with and through the pandemic, we kind of lost. I'd love to get back to it. So thank you all. Thank it was you. good to meet you. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Oh, merci.